Okay, so I'm talking about these 10 common concurrency models. There are even more, but these are the most common, and probably you've seen, you're using at least one of these, um, and you've seen uh, most of these mentioned one or the, one of the others. The threads and locks, of course, has been there since the beginning of Java, 25 years nearly. Uh, the atomic stuff, the second one there, that was added 15 years ago. That's where you've got, if you're using a concurrent hash map, the underlying basis is on the atomic and thread local. Um, and functional programming introduced just in Java 8. Actors been around for a while. So these, these are, there's quite a lot of them there, and you've seen different ones. Some of them are very generic. The data parallelism is quite specific. It's, um, it, it was popularized because of uh, image processing, but nowadays it's becoming more mainstream because of machine learning, which can benefit brilliantly from data parallelism. Um, so I, I, I won't go into each of them in detail, but what I'm gonna do is explain why there are so many, which is the first question, why? Why are there so many? And if you like that, that's in Italy somewhere, the Bellagio uh, in Italy. All of these are from Instagram, hotels.com uh, Instagram account, the pictures. So the reason there are so many is these three words, shared mutable state, which I shall just quickly explain. Um, state is obvious. Mutable means you can change it. It is something that is stored in your computer, and it, but the, the memory location is going to be changed. The value there is going to be changed. So if you think of it as a variable, that variable is, is going to be... If it's a field of a class, it's going to be changed. It's not going to stay the same. That's mutable. And shared means that more than one thread is going to access that variable. And each, word of, each of these three words matters because it's the combination that makes concurrency difficult. And if you can get rid of any one of those words, then you make it much, much more simple, much more simple. I mean, uh, probably the, one of the things you read is stateless applications. You want to get your application stateless. And that's entirely true. If you, you, you hit the jackpot, if you can create a stateless application, uh, because that means you can scale it enormously and you don't have concurrency problems. So your choices are, to deal with your concurrency problems is to get rid of one of those words, or if you can't get rid of that one of those words, you have to use transactional operations. Um, and there's two types. You can use pessimistic transactions or optimistic transactions. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll explain those and, and uh, uh, show you uh, exactly what I mean by those. So going back to those 10 concurrency models, um, you'll see why there are so many, it's because they're all tackling one of those words. Or if they're not, they're giving you one of the options. So pessimistic, that's locks. Okay? And that's what you're getting from threads and locals. You're getting, they're locking, the, the, giving you a lock so you can prevent access to, an, to a, a variable, so you can change it, guarantee that you're the only one that's changing it, and then release that and let somebody else see it. Atomic and thread local, uh, sorry, that's threads and locks. Atomic and thread local, that's optimistic. And that's where we're using this operation that's in, the, in all modern uh, CPUs, which is a compare and swap or a compare and set uh, operation, which just says, um, okay, the, the value, it's got a value. I've got this value in the register. Um, if it is still this value and I want to change it, then it will change it atomically and I'll have the new value. And if it isn't that value when I want to change it, then my, my operation will fail and I'll have to retry. So that's an optimistic one. You're saying, okay, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be that value, so I'm going to try it. And if it isn't that value, I'll have to get the value that it is now and then try again or, or fail. Um, so these, those are the two that we have available to us without any of these frameworks. Uh, and they're the two that we're using all the time in Java and they're still very popular um, and still in use. But it's a lot of effort. If any of you went to the talk this morning with the uh, seven uh, sins or whatever they were, the, the seven concurrency, um, the most difficult things or the things you should know about, that's just uh, the top of the, 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 the... That's just like some examples. They're very difficult to do. So these, all these other frameworks, all concurrency models, are about trying to eliminate 
the problems. One of those words, shared mutable estate, so that you don't have to do the, the hard parts. You don't have to do the, the pessimistic or optimistic transaction or locking or uh, optimistic transactions there. Um, it gives you some kind of framework that lets you do that. So the functional programming, the, the idea there is, if you look at lambdas, they're all about avoiding mutation. It does a copy of the thing. Anytime you want to change something, um, let me give you an example of something that's immutable that you use all the time. String, the string class. String objects are immutable. You cannot change a string. If you want to make an, a, new, a, a different string, what you do is you create a new string with a, with a new version. So any of the operations on string that seem to change it will produce a new string. It's an immutable thing. So with functional programming, that's what you're doing. You're, you're making a copy, which is a, a new state. Um, in all of the, the, the lambda sequences. With actors, um, again, if you saw the talk this morning, they, they were talking about actors. In that case, it's all the actors holds the state. It is mutable, but it's not shared because the actor itself only gets updated in one single thread all the time. It just sits in that one thread, and the, inf the framework handles the message passing so that makes sure that it goes to that one thread where the actor is. Um, Communicating sequential processes. If you know Go, this is what um, Go uses. Uh, this is coming into Java. Um, as uh, So there is a framework called Quasar, which provides this, but it's never been fully integrated. There is now a project called Project Loom to build that into Java. It's, uh, it started a couple of versions ago, but it's going to take a couple more versions. It'll be fully there in the next long-term support version. But in the meantime, I expect that Java 14, so in about a year, you should have, um, if you pick up Java 14, I would expect you to be able to use that. Um, so that's uh, basically lightweight threads. So you can do millions of lightweight threads in your application instead of the thousands of threads that you can do. Uh, data parallelism, as I mentioned, that's, that's where if you think about it, a huge uh, two by two matrix, you get Every single value in that matrix is a different number, but the operation you do on every value is the same. And that works brilliantly with GPUs, uh, and that's why um, a lot of machine learning algorithms are based on matrix manipulation, and so it works brilliantly with machine learning. That's why it's uh, taken off um, being used a lot in machine learning. And then the other ones, um, event-driven, that's been there for... for yeah, that was before Java. That's been there since the 80s, the idea of event-driven applications. Um, and MapReduce more recently. And MapReduce is kind of similar to the uh, functional programming that we have implemented in Java. And the streams, it, it is, uh, it's actually MapFilterReduce, but it's called MapReduce. It's, so those two are kind of similar, uh, but again, it's still immutable. They're going for immutable, immutability. And then the last one I've got at the bottom there, grid computing. Think of Hazelcrest or Ignite, Apache Ignite. Um, they are pessimistic, basically, because if you distribute it, it's very difficult to do anything other than pessimistic. But they do actually have some optimistic optimizations in there. Um, but uh, that's, it, it, it's a different style. So each of these is a concurrency model which you would potentially be using to avoid the problems of concurrency. And that's why there are so many. So this is just an alternate view of that last slide, looking at uh, the various options. Stateless is interesting. There isn't, there isn't a framework for that. But you can make your application stateless by taking any state and moving it into um, parameters that are passed between everything rather than um, anything that's held in storage. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really difficult technique to get right, though. So there isn't really um, a framework for that one. So why isn't there a winner? That's the question. We, we've, got, I mean, we've had 25 years of, of locks, 15 years of, the, of optimistic... 30 years of event-driven applications. Um, Node.js, by the way, was that single... That was, sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, that one down there. Single-threaded, unshared, mutable state. That's a Node.js. Uh, although in Java, of course, it's Vertex. So, why isn't there a winner? It's because of maintenance. 
So it's, it's kind of funny because each of these is actually taking away problems from you. That's what the frameworks are for there. That's what the models are there for. Uh, apart from the, 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 the first two, where you're doing it all yourself, the models are all there to reduce uh, bugs. It's to take away the effort of dealing with concurrency. So you'd say, great, that's excellent. That's what I want. That's really what these are going to give me. But you end up using a framework instead of stuff that you're natively looking at. And the, the biggest example is a stack trace. Okay, you could ju you've got a bug, you get a stack trace, you can see exactly what your application is doing. You can tell pretty quickly from a stack trace where you want to look in your code and where it goes wrong. But when you're using any of the frameworks, it's much, much harder because you end up, a lot of the stack traces tends to be showing the framework implementation and not your actual business code. Uh, so you get to this stage where you build your lovely application using any of these frameworks, any of the different models, and it works beautifully when you've started. Then you start getting problems, and then you start to try and troubleshoot, and then you start ripping your hair out because it's, it is so painful. You get, all you do is you see framework stack trace after framework stack trace, and they never seem to have tools to help you either to debug it. So um, you, you end up putting in print statements. I mean, literally. You know, sometimes it, the, you, can, you can use the debugger, but more often than not, it's, it's catching threads that disappeared or s very strange things. So that's the main reason there isn't a winner, is that none of these frameworks have really good maintenance capabilities. Now, that's, it's kind of funny because they're, they're improving your maintenance, but then at the same time making it worse. So there's, what, there's, there's a, a kind of threshold. If your application is small enough, any of these models work beautifully, and you can debug it quite well because you can understand the full code base. So, for example, the ACA, the actor model, um, the recommendation is that you have less than 20 actors in your application. And I'm talking about the full microservice. I'm not talking about uh, across the entire s system. So in that one microservice, and they talk about, ideally, it would be like 10 actors. So if you can 10 actors, you can hold it in your head. But uh, it tends to expand. And, and once it gets to too many actors, you can't hold it in your head, and you can't understand what's happening. And you don't have the tools to help you do it. And it becomes very, very, very painful. So that's the main reason. There are those two functional programming and communicating sequential processes which do have the potential to eliminate um, that problem. The, in particular, the latter, the communicating uh, project loom uh, or the Quasar project, because the thread uh, uh, traces, the stack traces look very normal. They look exactly, they can integrate that into, into the JVM and it would look exactly like a normal stack trace. Um, so a lightweight thread and just producing a normal stack trace, that's brilliant. And the functional programming, that kind of, that's almost there, but it, you get a lot of the fork join framework in your stack traces uh, and you have to understand that. I mean, they could help by, by renaming everything that's in the, in the framework, ignore this. You know, and then you'd see the stuff after it, and then you'd understand it. So it's almost there. There's a limitation of functional programming. It's like a lot of the old 4GLs, is that if you, if you have the uh, function that you want to use, it's brilliant and really straightforward. If you don't have the function, then you have to write some quite complex code to get around it and simulate the function. So you're kind of dependent on them adding sufficient functions for, to handle all your edge cases. Um, but those two are the closest to being fully maintainable. And of course, the latter one isn't there yet, and the former one is gaining traction, but it's not entirely there yet. So that is my whistle-stop tour of uh, concurrency models. Thank you. <laughs>